do is talk about copper foil for high-speed digital applications. Over the last several years, there's been a lot of developments in the foil arena. Essentially, when we're talking about laminates for high-speed digital, the, the types of materials that are required uh, to create these new materials for the, uh, the high end of the spectrum, um, they require us to look at the resin system, the glass types and, and compositions, and the copper foil. Copper foil is going to be one of the more important aspects of the laminate design process. So I'm going to go through uh, a few things with you. So the agenda, uh, let's see if I can get my page down to work here. Not There we go. So the agenda today um, is going to be the market drivers. Why, why do we need the, these new types of copper foil? I'll go through the copper manufacturing process basics. Uh, look at the industry naming conventions and some of the some of the issues that IPC is starting to address with these new copper foils. Uh, new copper foil developments. Where where is the market going with those types of copper foils? And copper roughness. Basically, the rest of the story. Um, one of the problems that we run into in the industry is people um, will ask for the RZ of the material and assume that's going to be adequate for modeling. So with regard to modeling and copper roughness of your material, I'd like to go through that a little more detail and explain uh, that to you all. Um, the ultra smooth copper challenges. Obviously, there's some trade-offs. When you have a smooth foil, you have to be able to still bond that foil to your dielectric uh, uh, and resin. So we'll talk about that and the importance of the bond treatment on that. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with the market drivers. Um, the market drivers really is uh, you're looking at the next generation of uh, of uh, uh, data rates and and uh, and frequencies. So you're talking about uh, current designs are uh, in the 112 gigabits per second, 26 to 28 uh, gigahertz frequency range, and then people are looking at the uh, PAM4 224, which is in the 53 to 56 gigahertz range. And so these things. Um, are, are being investigated now. There's a lot of work at the PCB and design uh, design level that are looking at what we can do to get to that 224. Um, and so copper is one of those very important things in the next slide, we'll explain that. So with the future design requirements, um, you're gonna need an extremely low loss resin system, uh, no profile copper, which means no nodulation on the copper and probably something like quartz glass or another type of reinforcement that we haven't uh, really worked on uh, very much yet. Um, you're gonna need thermally robust products, reduced dielectric and conductor losses, um, and then um, uh, very low CTE, HDI capable because the density continues to get uh, finer and finer. And then these things have to go through some OM testing for HDI designs uh, for many of our OEM customers. Um, copper foil impact, these equations are just first, approxim first order approximations. So they're not the uh, there's a lot more complex equations out there that would give you what uh, a lot of the uh, EDA tools are using for their uh, conductor portion analysis in their in their in their tools. Uh, but down at the bottom, you can see a couple of charts. These are uh, from uh, uh, Matsui Copper Foil uh, presentation that uh, that I'm using here, and you can see this is an FR4 laminate. Uh, FR4 laminates are pretty lossy, so you got the the green is the dielectric loss, conductor loss is the copper colored loss. You can see the conductor loss overall is not a large uh, portion of the over total, overall total loss in the system. So, um, But as you get to high-speed digital materials, as that material, the loss of the dielectric uh, continues to be reduced by the resin system design and selection of the glass cloth. You're talking about the copper uh, conductor losses are going to be more significant in the total overall loss. And so that's why it's important as a laminators in the industry that we look at the copper and what we can do to, to help you improve uh, the overall total loss uh, for your applications. So ba basic uh, foil manufacturing. Um, this These are just some cartoons that were put together just to kind of give you some basic ideas of how this is done. Um, there's three major processes. They take the uh, uh, create the electrolyte. They use uh, raw copper wire. Um, these are all recycled materials. One of the questions we've been getting over the last couple of years is uh, on the on the raw materials used to make laminate, you know, um, for sustainability purposes, you know, what is used in your in your um, products, right? And so copper foil, it's all recycled copper foil. So you, I'll show you a picture in the next slide here. Next process is the uh, plating on the on the drum. And I'll show you a picture of one of these drums. It's a titanium drum that's polished to give you a very smooth surface. 
Uh, and then they do sur surface treatments. They put several, several different coatings on these materials uh, to create the finished copper roll. Now, if you're talking about battery foil, um, these surface treatment processes are not used like they are for the, uh, for the uh, copper foil that's used in the uh, PCB manufacturing process. So we'll start out with the uh, electrolyte formation process, and then uh, we'll go into uh, that. Uh, essentially, now these equations do not explain all of the processes, uh, just very generic um, equations, chemical equations to, to show what's going on. They're basically taking this raw copper and creating a, a turning it into copper sulfite solution. So uh, there's a picture of one of the, the uh, dissolving tanks that they use, and then they end up with basically the, the plating solution that they're going to use uh, to, to plate the copper foil onto the, uh, onto the material. And as you can see down in the corner, this is a recycled copper foil that's being used. Um, I've also seen in, uh, in uh, Circuit Foil Luxembourg, they actually have this little one inch long piece of strip that's used to seal tin cans for food. So they cut that off and there's literally dump truck loads of those that are, that are um, brought into the plant and they, they dissolve those and make those into copper foil at their facility. The next uh, process would be the electro plate uh, of the copper onto the titanium drum. Um, the, the drum's the cathode, and then they have the anode uh, surrounding that. Um, and this is what that process looks like. So you can see here in the middle picture, uh, you've got a very large uh, titanium drum, maybe 1.5 meters in diameter, maybe a little bit little bit bigger or smaller. Um, but you can see there's a, on, on the right-hand picture, you can see there's a titanium uh, plate that's wrapped around this drum. And that, and that titanium plate is polished. Okay, and they take a very fine uh, brush and they polish that entire um, entire surface. There's only a couple of these drum manufacturers in the world, and there's also only a few that can do the polishing uh, for that. This particular process of polishing the drum is one of the most important processes. This actual surface is is the this one over here, the drum side or the or the uh, plated side of the material. This is where. Uh, you can see some of the streaks in the material. This represents what you see as the polishing marks in the material itself. So that brush that polishes these drums leaves a surface topography on the on the drum itself. And this is where they're doing their investment in finer polishing capabilities down to less than one micron. Okay, so you can see the uh, the base foil properties are going to be anywhere from two microns up to 400 microns. They control the uh, percent elongation in this process. They either use the shiny side or the matte side uh, for either uh, an RTF type foil or an HTE shiny side foil. Um, this one here is showing you the, uh, the 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 kind of the lumps that occur from the from the grain structure of the copper. This is also an area. This grain structure with battery foils has been uh, reduced pretty significantly, and battery foils are the most common uh, products uh, made today for the high speed digital end of the uh, materials used at Isola and other laminators. So we'll look at the treating process next. Um, what they do is they, they apply a nodulation onto the material, um, and then they put an anchoring over the top of that, so it kind of holds those nodules onto the, onto the surface. But you can see here's the uh, matte side uh, opposite of the drum. Um, and then after nodulation and anchoring, you can see what that looks like. You can see that the, there's little tiny little balls. And, and if you're familiar with the cannonball method, uh, that's used in EDA tools. That's kind of where that comes from. They, they look at these little things as little stacks of cannonballs. It's not a perfect model, but it's how it was done in the past. Uh, there's some newer models that are taking a different look at this. These actually in cross sections, I'll show you a picture. These are actually more like pillars, uh, like in a cave, uh, like a stalagmite, I think it, is what it would be. Um, and we'll see that in a picture downstream. Here again is that streaking you see from the polishing effect on the titanium drum. And this is the nodulation on the shiny side sur surface. So you can see that these actually have a little bit of that same drum um, effect on here as well. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, they put a barrier treatment on, then passivation. Uh, and then what they put on here is a silane coating. The silane coating has become, become more and more important. Uh, unfortunately, not every resin system is the same. And so these silane coatings uh, that they put on there for adhesion from a chemical perspective, they tend to be different from each of the different uh, uh, laminate suppliers. So um, just keep that in mind. This is kind of how that treatment of the copper foil works. We have on the shiny side, which would be the drum side, for a standard HTE shiny type copper, even though this is a might be a battery foil, they put a passivation layer on here. Uh, that's kind of the, the layer that allows us to, uh, 
to adhere uh, onto the onto the laminate, and then the the stain proof material. Um, and this is the the foil, the drum foil, and, and this is not an actual picture. We kind of put a, a little bit of roughness over here just for demonstration. Uh, so you get your anchoring and dendrite layer on here. So that uh, dendrite layer and then anchoring creates that roughness uh, for the mechanical bonding. And then you have the barrier layer and then a passivation layer and then a silane layer. With the high performance materials, you're gonna see uh, no passivation and no dendrite uh, on the very high end HVLP5 type materials. Okay, copper naming convention. Sorry if I'm going pretty fast through this. Um, these copper naming conventions, and I'm not sure why this is happening. I apologize. We'll click through this quickly. Uh, these are all the different types of copper foils. Whoops, go back. These are all the different types of copper foils that are available in laminates today. Um, we can get down to two, three, and five micron. These come with a, a two ounce copper carrier uh, in our special order, but these are the most common foils that are used more the the one third and one quarter ounce are more commonly used by the PCB fabricators for HDI structures and then they plate these up most common materials that we sell in the industry are half ounce and one ounce copper foil that represents about I'd say about 90 percent of the overall copper foil we do sell uh one ounce for you know or two ounce for ground plane type applications some customers are using a three to 12 ounce copper foil for a high voltage and and uh, heat sink type of uh, scenarios where you need to remove um, uh, heat out from the material. Um, the heavy coppers um, are shipped with a, uh, an HTE shiny foil surface. There is some two ounce copper that is RTF, but it's not common. Um, as far as lead times, they can be pretty long for these heavy and ultra thin coppers. So if you're building the design with that, you wanna make sure you get some forecasting out to your PCB fabricator. Let them know that you're going, going to need the copper uh, to, to get that into your design uh, because the copper manufacturers will take some time to, to get those out to you, to the laminate supplier to build the materials. Um, these are some of the acronyms. I don't know why this thing is sticking up here, but apologize. Anyway, so <laughs> we'll answer the, the questions at the end of the session, by the way. <clears throat> um, ED, electrodeposited, that's your standard shiny copper foil. HTE elongation, that's a foil that has a little bit uh, different grain structure, more towards the battery foil end of the, of the grain structure to give it more flexibility. It makes it a little softer. Uh, drum side treated foil, this was a polyclad patent that originally came out when we started using the drum side of the uh, foil to bond to the laminate. Um, and then the counter to that from the other copper foil suppliers that uh, were not involved with the patent, um, uh, was reverse treated foil. And so that's the same type of foil. Both of those are identical. Uh, then uh, the industry went to a very low profile copper foil. That very low profile copper foil uh, was was used, uh, used to improve the overall um, edge, edge capability of the material, but also the uh, electrical uh, performance pr uh, attributes of the material. Advanced RTF foil um, was introduced maybe about four or five years ago. Kotec was probably the first company out there to uh, introduce this foil. Isola now offers this foil on our high-end products. It offers about a 5 to 8% improvement, even over an HVLP copper foil. Um, high freak, uh, the HVLP was uh, coined by, I think, Fruikawa, um, and then a uh, company, Panasonic, uh, picked that up as naming convention for their foils. The industry in general seems to be using that quite a bit now, and I'll show you a couple of uh, examples of that from foil suppliers but it, it's basically a high frequency, very low profile. And X is indicating the uh, generation. So there's generation HVLP, HVLP2, HVLP3, all the way up to five now, with four and five being the, the products in development and, and evaluation at this time. And then there's rolled annealed foil. Uh, Mysola doesn't use this. It's not a very common foil. It's used for, the, for a lot of the different uh, RF microwave type products, but Isola, has found that some of the new HVLP coppers can match the electrical performance, uh, conductor loss performance of rolled annealed foil. Uh, the foil only comes in 25 inch wide rolls too, and that makes manufacturing very difficult. And so we tend to try to avoid uh, uh, selling that foil and offer the plated foils, electroplated foils as an option that uh, meets or exceed, even exceeds the annealed foil capabilities. So IPC, uh, for roughness parameters, this is kind of their generic way of describing them. So you have your standard foil. I've seen uh, uh, roughness all the way up to almost 19 microns back in the day when this was the standard uh, for adhesion for, you know, especially for automotive applications. 
uh, IPC low profile or LP, uh, that's down to, uh, you know, less than or equal to 10 microns or 10.2. And then the very low profiles uh, down at 5.1, um, which, you know, that categorizes pretty much all of the high-speed digital applications. And so uh, there's no there's no IPC designation or recognition of copper profiles for smoother VP, VLP coppers. Uh, there is a new specification that works. So I think I'll mention this another time in the in the presentation here. But the industry has been using the term HVLP. ISOL has been using VLP2 or VLP1. Uh, we think that describes the foil roughness a little better in generic terms. Um, but that's kind of the way the industry is moving is HVLP. Um, this is our current foil specification. Um, you can see the little table up in the upper uh, left-hand side just kind of describes what I just went through. Uh, so the currently we have limited designations. There's no HVLP or ultra smooth designation. Uh, grade three is the most common foil currently used in high volume, uh, low layer count type applications. And again, uh, half one and two ounce are the most common. Uh, IPC is working on the update to the specification. I've seen some of the conversations back and forth with the foil suppliers and, and laminators. Um, overall, these are the different types of descriptions that are in this IPC 40, 45 uh, 62 specification, if you have that or would like to see that. So we're going to the new copper foil developments, right? So this is where uh, our copper foil um, is really uh, changing over the last several years. Um, you know, typical roughness on the bond side. Now the bond side uh, or, or drum side, that's the side that we put against um, our laminate. Okay, so we, and I'll show a picture of this um, in the future slide. Uh, but this will give you an idea of where these products are at uh, with regard to roughness. It's, you know, it's simply a data sheet, and it doesn't describe precisely the, the numbers that are going to be needed for modeling. So there's a lot of good papers out there. One of the papers I'll mention in the future slide here from Bert Seminovich um, with regard to copper foil roughness and how to model those. He uses one particular model for his, his work, but uh, there's some good modeling information in here uh, downstream. Um, so bondside roughness, uh, HVLP or VLP1, uh, 2 to 2.5RZ um, is kind of what they, they're using here in this case. Um, uh, a, uh, ARTF, you'll probably hear a lot more about that type of copper foil. That's the standard RTF foil, but it's an advanced version where the drum side is much smoother. Again, goes back to that drum polishing process that I mentioned earlier on. Um, HVLP3, that's kind of the standard foil used today. Uh, if you're doing anything in AI, you're probably using that foil. However, HVLP4 is in development, and I think we're going to see some uh, migration into that type of copper foil in the near future. Uh, one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at these uh, data sheets, if you look at the copper foil data sheet for the specific, specific type of laminate that you're using, um, uh, for Isola, this is uh, the standard VLP2 type copper that's shared here from circuit foil. Um, and this, uh, this should kind of demonstrate that they're using the JIS method for, for measuring their surface roughness. And I'll show you a methodology that they use. Uh, but there's also the ISO standard RZ method. And keep in mind, RZ is a single line uh, versus a surface area measurement number. But with, uh, with this, you can see that circuit foil uses GIS. You're going to see different numbers of roughness for half ounce copper foil versus one ounce copper foil, as you can see in the middle of the chart here. Okay, so those roughness values change based on copper weight, you know, the, the one ounce, half ounce, et cetera. Uh, the EDA modeling software, they're starting to use the SA values. So keep that in mind. Um, maybe... Uh, these may be derived from different equipment types and resulting in different results. There's actually two round robins that had been done back in the past at the IPC uh, round robins, and they found that uh, they couldn't measure a single standard the same and get the same values. And so it's a little bit um, of work to be done on that still, but I think we're getting closer uh, as an industry in, in standardizing these things. This is a chart from Kotech, Norman at Kotech. If you ever would like to meet him, please let me know. I'll connect you. Um, these, uh, these are the things that they're working on. I had mentioned early, earlier that uh, these are the new generations, uh, fifth and, and sixth generation of, of advanced RTF copper foils. Isola is currently in conversations with uh, Kotec and other suppliers of these types of copper foils. Uh, about, I'm doing testing internally. We test almost every version of copper that comes out with regard to high-speed digital applications. 
on our materials. You can see right now they've got a product called uh, PFI 10. It's an HVLP4 copper foil. We're currently finalizing qualifications there. We're also doing uh, looking at the HVLP5, uh, which is going to be available in this uh, coming quarter here. For satellite and SEO type stuff, uh, this is a pretty common one. It's used by one of the highest volume satellite manufacturing companies out there uh, for HDI structures. It's primarily purchased by the, by the PCB fabricator. But they're working on the next generation of that product with a surface profile that's uh, lower than one micron. Um, and so there's a group of products that are in development. Some of these are going to be uh, developed uh, throughout this year for both uh, PTFE and LCP type products. And so um, these are these are kind of the direction that copper foil manufacturers are going uh, from a roadmap standpoint. And you can see also these are kind of for, for PCI uh, E Gen 5, 1 and 2 and PCI 6 is coming soon. And then uh, PCI 7 is kind of in the future generation thinking process right now. Oh, oh man, I went way past that. <laughs> my, my apologies. We'll get back to there. Okay. Hit the wrong button. Um, here we go back to, uh, uh, this is a, a circuit foil Luxembourg copper foil, uh, kind of a, it's not a roadmap, but it's kind of the direction they're going with regard to their products. You can see that uh, the current HVLP, this is what we use on our products, for example, Tachyon 100G. But we also use this uh, BFNN as our next generation of, uh, of a VLP1 or one micron copper that we make it available as well as the advanced RTF copper, which is pretty good compared to these two, but this is probably our current best available. Um, we are currently working on this one here. You can see that the, the surface profiles are lower uh, and the nodulation is finer. Um, and then as you're, you're talking about this, we'll talk about skin depth here in a moment, but you're getting down to the HVLP5. And I think this generation of material, uh, copper foil material from our suppliers, this is gonna be a material that does not have nodulation on it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like in cross section, but this is in development this year and should start to be available here during this year after we've got qualifications. I'll talk about some of the concerns about these foils when we get into into those those types of foils. So the rest of the story here, um, skin effect. Um, if you've if you've done anything in SI, you're you're well aware of this uh, phenomenon, where the the signal starts to move to the very outside. Uh, perimeter of the of the transmission line, right? So you're talking about what's going on in the very surface of the foil. And so when we go back to that one slide where we're talking about the uh, the passivation, the silane, the, the barrier coatings, the nodulation, all those things, that that's where your signal is moving to, right? That's where the skin is, is that very thin layer of uh, of the uh, the copper foil treatments and 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 coatings that are on that foil. So they are working on those. Um, Couple of the things that I didn't put in this presentation that are that are being worked on. So, uh, elimination for high speed digital. They've eliminated nickel in in that in that foil um, treatment process. Uh, also, arsenic is being eliminated. So most of most of the new foils are arsenic free, which is a, a pretty important attribute of the foil. Um, so those kinds of things are outside of what this presentation is talking about. But um, so you're you know what what foils should you be uh, using as your starting point, right? So HTE standard grade three, if you're doing standard uh, products where, where they're low cost and you're doing a standard FR4, uh, the foil uh, losses are pretty small, like I showed in the earlier slide. Um, you, you can use this uh, for those types of designs, you know, 10 layer uh, product at low frequencies. RTF and VLP, the benefit there is more along the characteristics of etching capabilities. Uh, they do give you some uh, better high frequency performance, uh, but generally speaking, uh, from a loss perspective, there were fairly high loss conductor uh, foils. Uh, HVLP, that's been the standard for about five or six years now um, for the high end, um, ultra low loss and low lo very low loss type of materials. Um, our, our materials being ITER MT40 and Tachyon 100G as examples. Um, these are especially, um, important for your high frequencies based on the chart I saw you can showed you, you can kind of understand how that works and why the conductor losses versus the, the dielectric losses are becoming more and more um, important overall. And as the dielectric losses are reduced, the conductor losses are only reduced by, uh, by uh, developments in the copper foil, right? So 
Uh, the newest design uh, of copper foil um, mentioned probably in the last four years has been the advanced uh, reverse treated foils, which improve the signal integrity. And honestly, I think this is probably the best innovation within the industry. And the reason why is because the RTF, the drum side of the foil, the only side that Isola can control on that foil, that's the one that goes against the laminate. And that's the only one that really is important to us as a laminate supplier. The other side of the foil, which is going to be a little bit rougher going into the into the PCB fabrication process, is going to be the one controlled by the PCB fabricator in their uh, bond treatment capabilities using alternative oxides or non-etch oxide type uh, of treatments. So copper foil roughness is really important to understand what these values actually are. And these are a couple of charts off the internet. I, I don't know who made them, but gives you an idea of uh, how they're measured. Uh, RA is kind of the average roughness of the surface. So it's not really looking at the, the peaks and valleys of that so much as, as that average uh, mean. Um, so that's, that's a little bit different. It tends to be a little bit uh, better number if you're looking at it uh, than RZ. RZ is kind of the average difference between the peaks. It's a peak and valley measurement. I think they take 10 peaks and valleys and, and then come up with that. Um, and then the ISO versus... Uh, our uh, JIS, uh, they tend to get a better result uh, with ISO. Um, uh, and so, or excuse me, the JIS. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're looking at data sheets from the copper suppliers or, or whatever information you get. RQ, kind of an R RMS uh, method, um, they tend to give you a much lower result even than the RA on the same surface. However, you're going to be looking at, uh, people are going to be moving, at least with the ADA tools, I'll show you a slide here soon, um, with regard to the uh, arithmetic mean method that um, these RZ, RA, and RQ methods are, um, this is kind of a scan. And this picture over on the right-hand side on the bottom, that gives you an idea of what those scans look like. And those scans take an area and measure that instead of the, uh, of the straight line method. So measurement equipment and ru resulting roughness values are going to be significantly different from copper supplier to supplier. So correlation, as I mentioned, has been difficult. Um, this is a, a courtesy of circuit foil. Uh, Julie is uh, the president of the company. If you're interested, I can introduce you. She will be at uh, the Design Con show in a couple of weeks, and uh, she'll be available to ask questions along with, with her team. Um, but you can see the context stylus method. This has been a method that's been used quite a long time in the industry, but it's just not adequate for these low profile coppers. You can kind of see what it does to the surface of the copper. Uh, kind of puts a, a, you know, it's kind of like plowing the surface versus measuring the surface. And then there's the uh, contactless roughness. This is the white light or collimated light laser scanning infra interferometry. Um, it does a pretty good job. Um, there is some shadow effects when you get down to the mi one micron. It's a little bit more difficult to get a good, good value from these methods if you don't have very state-of-the-art equipment. Um, so I still actually use those SEM methodologies um, as well as the contactless laser profilimity to, to measure copper foil. Uh, as well as cross sections for validation of the of the treatment on the material. So these are some pictures uh, that give you kind of an idea of the kinds of variations you're going to see. Um, obviously, the the skin depth is is what we're looking at here in these pictures off to the right hand side. Uh, the electrical electrical performance of the copper in the treatment layer is really the key to the ultra low loss copper family uh, that's going on. That's where all the work's being done. So the things that are important to keep in mind is the magnitude of the roughness. Okay, you can kind of see, um, you know, in this top picture here, this is a one micron copper foil. You can see the nodules are very small. We actually have some measurements in there you can barely see. Um, this is a, a 1.3 micron. This is hardly any different. These are the same magnifications, but you can see these nodules are much larger than the one micron uh, foil. And then here's a, here's a foil that's 1.7. So you can even see that this one and this one, they don't even look the same, but this one's supposed to have um, larger uh, larger uh, nodules than this one. But uh, this one actually a small, uh, uh, a higher number and actually had a higher loss performance in our testing. Um, but it's really interesting to see these when you do uh, SEM images on these. And this is surface variation. So this is a, that drum brushing again. And this is probably an older photo. So the drum brushing is probably a little more rough than what you'd see in the, in the current generation of new developed products. Um, you can see here where they've had the nodulization on the material again, um, and this one here as well. So you're looking at grain structure of the copper as well. So I mentioned earlier that battery foils are more commonly used uh, now for high-speed digital. Um, that's a smaller grain structure. It's a softer copper, um, and it does uh, tend to uh, change the 
uh, the microscopic resistance values, um, as you know, higher resistance uh, is higher loss. Um, the shape of the roughness you can see in this uh, lower left-hand group of pictures, you can see these have shapes in them. Um, the smaller, more round, more uh, uniform shapes tend to give you better overall um, uh, uh, loss performance and they don't reflect as much energy. Um, the density of the roughness you can see as you get to finer and finer copper uh, nodulization, the, the density of those nodules will be higher um, and that surface skin will have a more arduous pass. So they have to come up with a way to reduce loss based on the way the nodulization has been done. And then of course the directionality, which is something that you can actually test and see in your X and Y direction on test vehicles and SITV. Um, there's a small difference, but it's something to keep in mind in your design process. You know, ultra low loss copper, uh, usually classified by roughness level, normally in microns, the RZ value, uh, is often used as the only designator, which is kind of a big mistake, and it's a serious over oversimplification of the reality. So uh, please keep that in mind if you're into real detailed design where you're going up to 224, uh, PAM4 type of designs, that, uh, and those are, those are going to be really important aspects to understand about the copper foil. Uh, this is not a true agreement on how to measure roughness. Uh, there's not a true agreement. Um, so we haven't really come to that, but I think SA, um, SR type measurements are going to be the, the standard going forward. So cop performance performance really needs to be validated and defined by the laminate supplier and PCB fabricator. So your laminate supplier should know what their copper foil performance is. Your PCB su supplier, when they're doing HDI or top foil uh, on your on your materials for your, for your stack ups uh, on foil laminations, really need to understand what copper foil they're using and what the performance level of that copper foil is because it's going to make a difference on how your your actual design works. I mean, you're going to say, okay, I have, I have very low profile copper inside my board, but I don't know what's on the outside of my board on my foil lamination process. Um, screening and evalu evaluation. This is an older slide. Just kind of gives you an idea of what the differences are in these uh, copper foils. So these are all considered one micron copper foils um, that we put we put into testing where we measured all of these copper foils all the way through uh, the 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 uh, SITV, and you can see that they're not all the same. They're different. So just because you specify an RZ of one, less than one micron, your performance level and your conductor losses could be completely different. So this foil that it was compared to is the zero line on this chart on the lower left-hand side. You can see other copper foils that are pretty close. You can see that they start to deviate once you get above 12 um, uh, gigahertz in the frequencies. Some of them are pretty good. They're pretty close, only maybe three to 5% difference. And that could be attributed to the actual foil lot. And I'll show you some variation that happens in those as well. So this was a five mil dielectric, dielectric microstrip on a 10 mil line, 50 ohm impedance. Um, we down select using this type of method on our copper foils. And then we do a, an eight layer SITV to evaluate these materials. And we use an ultra low loss material, a tachyon 100G. Uh, when we do our testing, we plot the difference to pick the best copper. We also do uh, solder, float, solder float and, uh, and uh, peel strength capability. And then we put that into an SITV. And if it, and if it uh, meets our SITV requirements for our customers' loss requirements, we go ahead and put that material into a calf test. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but that calf test is very important because if you don't have good bonding between your copper and resin, and then after the copper is removed, if you have a really smooth copper, you leave a shiny laminate surface on there and your prepreg has to bond to that. We'll talk about that in a minute. So foil, the foil suppliers, uh, the loss comparisons are done. Uh, this is done on a half ounce copper foil. We're looking at you know, how these foils um, actually uh, look as they go um, through frequency. And you can see how these copper foils uh, all uh, were, were different. You can see our baseline foil, uh, which was a one micron foil and how these all compared. So it's important for your foil um, to be understood by your both your PCB fabricator and your and your laminator. So here's some of the challenges I mentioned just a little bit ago. So cost, you know, obviously you're talking about 40 to 50 cents per square foot on a thin core for HVLP over HVLP uh, and advanced RTF copper foil. Uh, the lead time generally longer. Uh, because these are specially treated for the resin system, it might be six to eight weeks to get large large quantities of the, these materials through your through the the suppliers. So you have to be sure to forecast with uh, with your PCB fabricator, who should share that with your with your laminator. Uh, due to the resin specific signing coatings, the products are basically made to order. 
Um, we do have some inventories that I sold on these products, uh, but one of the problems we run into is the shelf life uh, of the siding on here. It's similar to glass, so they don't last forever. So we have to be careful not to have too much material to sit around waiting for someday getting orders in, in a high volume. Um, challenges and trade-offs, there's a yield and processing. Um, obviously, peel strength may be lower, so you have to do an A-bus with that uh, with your users. Uh, generally, our, our requirement is a 3.5 three, three PL, three PLA with a minimum of 3.0. We don't ship anything below that. I know if you're a user of uh, a PTFE, that, that that value might be a little bit lower, down to 2.5, but you're really risking um, the surface topography, you know, the surface um, uh, structures falling off, <laughs> falling off the surface during processing your P at your PCB fabricator. Um, so you got uh, copper is softer and it's more difficult to handle. So you got percent potential yield issues like uh, handling of the material if you scuff or scratch or damage the surface during your handling during inner layer processing. Um, it's a little bit more difficult. So um, if you're going to purchase a uh, HVLP3 copper, you really should not be using alternative oxide processes. The roughness on the alternative oxide process is, is performed by micro etching the surface. So you're removing metal from the surface and creating a, a topography, which is maybe not rough uh, from a RA standpoint or RZ standpoint, but from a pathway standpoint for your signals. Those are very rough surfaces. They have a lot of, a lot of arduous uh, um, etched surfaces that they have to pass. So that makes the, and it reduces the, the overall uh, benefit of getting the, the copper. And we've seen situations where our customers have purchased a very high performance copper. They put a standard oxide on their alternative oxide. It just basically wiped out that, that cost of that material that they, they put into the, into the laminate. A reliability concerns, I mentioned just a minute ago, the bond line failure issue. Uh, that's the uh, failure mechanism where the etched core uh, bonded next to the prepreg, where the prepreg is melted and then bonded in the lamination process at your PCB fabricator. That bond line between those two has to be very good so it doesn't delaminate and it doesn't cause uh, failure downstream where you have copper uh, solutions being um, uh, having a capillary effect uh, along that bond or it doesn't create a calf failure because it's a weak bond. And we get, uh, we have tested and seen this in cases where copper foil doesn't have the siling that isn't easily removed in the process. And so we've worked with our laminate suppliers for quite a long time to improve the overall uh, treatment process so that we can use that in uh, in creating a good smooth laminate surface bond to our prepreg. So that's a, an important aspect that uh, we have to consider as a laminator before we sell that material to you. And we do that through calf testing. Another thing to keep in mind, <clears throat> this was testing done on uh, one roll of one micron copper roughness material. So this, uh, this picture down on the bottom of the cartoon shows you a roll all stretched out. And so what we did is take 10 meter segments uh, and we created uh, test vehicles out of those each of those 10 meter segments. We did 33, we lost five of them during the production. So we measured 28 of those 10 meter long segments. So we had samples one through 28. Uh, we built microstrip test samples using a five mil thick, uh, extremely low loss material it was Terra Green 400G. Um, we took a total of five samples out of each one of those segments and measured them up to 60 gigahertz. So the loss per inch was extracted using the Delta L method on our VNA uh, system. So that, that test produced uh, this result on one single copper roll. Okay, so when you're measuring uh, these values, uh, let's say you you bring this into your SI lab and you're you're evaluating the copper foil, and one day you get uh, really good numbers, and the next day the numbers are off by a few percent. Well, this is why, because even though the copper foil supplies suppliers are running that drum and it's always at a constant pace, and then they put that through that uh, nodulation process, uh, the physics of the whole thing does not produce a perfect foil all the way through that process. And so you do get some variation downstream. Uh, this does include some of the measurement variation as well as the dielectric and conductor loss variation. So you can see that uh, this is another area where moving down to those much smoother foils is going to be benefit to the users trying to get to that next generation of high-speed digital types of materials. So this is some measurements that were done. Remember I mentioned that I would show you some SEM measurements, and this is kind of measurements of a 
I believe this is a one micron foil here, or it, it might be might be two two. No, it's a one micron foil because it's under two here. And so you can see these aren't really cannonballs, as the cannonball model um, explains to you, right? So this is a little different look when you're talking about this nodulations. They look more like stalagmites. And this image here shows some measurements of those. And you can see that skin effect is a, is a big deal. Look at how long that path, if that signal has to follow each one of these nodules on this material. And so that the left one is a half ounce, the right one is a one ounce copper foil. You can see the nodules are about the same for both of these copper foils. But that's the surface that we bond to the laminate, okay? Um, from a modeling standpoint, you can see there's different types of EDA tools. Um, you can see that some of them are still using the RZ parameter, but I think they're going to be moving to SR, SA type parameters. Uh, ANSYS and Cadence are using S SR. Um, this is a comp compliments of Bert Sabinovich of LAMSIM. Um, he's an SI expert that I work with co uh, commonly. He's uh, got a new paper at DesignCon. Um, I would highly recommend going to see. It's uh, regarding the anisotropy of laminates and how to model to... Uh, to, to, to address that. And so um, please take some time to go to that uh, seminar for BERT um, if you want to learn about that. Um, and so you got Symbior and Altium. Uh, they use the, uh, the SR parameters and, uh, and roughness factors that they've created. So um, there's different tools with different values that are using. Um, what I would suggest that uh, if you're doing designs on isola materials, I would suggest you give us a call uh, we have a gentleman named Eamon Isaac. He is an SI engineer. He's 20 some years of experience designing on RF and high-speed digital applications. He comes from the industry uh, at Molex and then moved over to Isola recently. And uh, he's a, a good expert. He can help you get your design on track and help you to reduce your cycle on these um, new materials. We've got a lot of test data on copper foils on our materials. So he's able to pr provide you some very specific data on, on those materials. So we've tested over 30 types of ultra low loss material foils. So I've showed you some of that data. Uh, just note that the EDA models use different roughness values, which might result in slightly different results. They're not too significantly different, but if you really need to dial in as you move up the frequency and bandwidth and data rate uh, scale, you probably should uh, have a conversation with Eamon. Um, so there's a SI expertise beyond the roughness that uh, you're probably gonna need to, to make sure you model properly for your next generation. Uh, so Isola can provide that guidance. I'm sure other laminate suppliers can do the same. Um, so just some images here. And as our time is getting close, I think I want to get through this a little faster. So these images, you can review these and just kind of give you some ideas of the HTE, standard RTF type foil. And then this is an HVLP foil uh, with a standard roughness. And then the new ones, I don't have images of those in this presentation. But the last thing I'd like to cover here, and that's the, uh, the oxide treatment. And I'd like to make sure that we talk about this uh, because really the one that we control is this one on the bottom. So you're looking at the bottom surface, which is uh, basically a, two, a, a VLP2 copper foil. And you can see the little pillars that are used for the mechanical adhesion portion. and you can see the little glass fibers uh, down in the bottom here. Um, so that's the laminate side down here. The bond treatment side, that's everything else, right? So you're talking about roughly uh, on a one ounce copper, it's quite a bit more, but on a half ounce copper, you're probably probably talking about 55 to 60 percent of the treatment on the perimeter of your transmission line is something that your PCB fabricator does for you. So keep this in mind when you're doing your modeling. Keep it in mind when you're selecting your PCB fabricator and find out what uh, oxide treatment they're using. There's a lot of the large uh, PCB fabricators out there now um, that do have this process in place. I mean, people like uh, Isupetasis, GCE, Woos, uh, TTM, you know, on and on those, all those big guys, they all have a different uh, one or one or another of these different non-etch or very low etch types of uh, oxide treatment out there. So uh, performance is going to be based on the skin and that skin is going to be modified, metal modified for most of the suppliers out there, unless you tell them you want a low loss, uh, best in class type of bond treatment. So make sure you specify that with your PCB fabricator and find out what they have and make sure that things are going to work. So the, probably the first one out there was a Shikoku Glycap. There's Autotech Bond Film HF Plus and then a McDermott uh, M Speed HF. And there's some other ones out there made in Asia and China that are out there. I'm not sure the performance level, um, but they're getting more and more to a non etch. In our conversation with one of our customers yesterday, 
Uh, they use like the Shikoku Glycop type where there's a non-etch uh, type of, so you get the um, the uh, inner layer etch process on the side, and then you get the surface topography of the foil itself as your overall topography. And if you look at those uh, matte side pictures, you'll see what that looks like. So here is a, a couple of good versus bad. Um, and we've done some testing on this. So you get pore loss when you get this really rough uh, oxide treatment, even though these are the same uh, vendor tooth profile that we put on our laminate. Um, and this is really important. I mean, you get three and a half versus 1.2 microns on the surface topography. You're talking about a very significant difference in the overall roughness. So please keep this in mind when you're uh, working with your supplier to, if you're doing high speed digital, very high end, this is a very important thing. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind, and I don't have this one in there, there is a variation within their process from day to day. Uh, the best suppliers are really good at controlling, uh, but if your, your supplier is not really good at controlling their oxide process and making sure they have consistent roughness, you're going to get day to day variation in their overall process. So just kind of keep that in mind as well. Um, here's some testing that we did, just uh, trying to finish up here uh, on smoother copper versus uh, no treatment on oxide treatment. And if you compare these two, you can look at it um, on, this is a Tachyon 100G material. You can see there is an improvement about five, uh, seven and a half to five percent going from an HVLP uh, top copper to an HVLP three type copper. The same is true with going to an ARTF, an advanced RTF copper foil. You can see the oxide treatment, what the effect of that is. Even if your oxide treatment is only maybe two or three microns, um, it makes a difference and it adds to the overall copper uh, conductor losses on this. So there's a benefit uh, with standard oxide of about four to five percent improvement uh, roughly in your materials in, in the standard uh, capabilities of the material. So keep that in mind uh, that your oxide is going to reduce. So make sure to pick a good oxide with a low loss. Um, here's an example of, uh, of a customer that uh, actually processed their uh, inner layers back through oxide a second time because they had set for a while and they wanted to make sure that the oxide was in good condition. Basically in the same board on the same structures, we had two different levels of loss on there. You can see this uh, uncontrolled process where they did a second process ended up in some additional loss on the oxide coating. Um, basic summary, summary here, this is the last slide, I believe. Um, ultra smooth uh, copper foils, uh, they're expensive and should be considered only when very low loss to extremely low loss materials. ITER MT40 TAC M100G, uh, Terra Green uh, 400G uh, for our products. Uh, keep in mind, logistics are challenging. So production usage will require some forecasting if you're going into high volume, especially as you ramp up in AI because these materials are in high demand now. Um, we will need to make sure that we have the best copper foils for you. So that's Isola's job. Uh, make sure you do that the same with the, uh, the laminate suppliers. Um, there's lots of new technologies that are coming out. So keep, keep an eye out for those. Ask questions of your suppliers. Isola is happy to tell you when we got a new supplier in the uh, in the pipeline with a new and a more improved copper foil performance. Uh, we'll let you know when we've got them qualified. Um, the, make sure you have an agreement uh, with your customers on the thermal mechanical performance and peel strength. So make sure that you're okay with the peel strength of the material that's being sold to you. Uh, make sure they have good thermal mechanical performance and, and don't have delamination or, or uh, bond line failure issues. Um, ask, ask the questions if it's been tested. Um, and we'll need to develop, develop some guidelines on low last factors by copper type, as well as uh, the, the usage. So you, you don't really have tools right now that can tell you, hey, this is a grade A, grade B, grade C type of uh, SI performance copper foil right now. And the last thing, Ian, just since copper uh, PCB processing will have a bigger impact on copper oxide coating, uh, re results are going to be ten dependent on the, the user, the, the PCB fabricator user. So um, just because the final load on that, it's not just the copper, it's the oxide coating that makes a big difference as well. And I think that is the last slide. So um, please uh, uh, put any questions you have in there. And I think, uh, Lucy, I'm supposed to click on these questions here and start answering those questions verbally. So let's go ahead and go through these. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, passivation and barrier layers are, are metallics. That is correct. So. They, the copper suppliers do not really share uh, those those types of uh, information. Uh, in the in the past, I've heard in conversations, you know, there was there's a tin based, a brass based. Uh, there's been some nickel involved. 
arsenic involved. So that those those different layers have different chemistries that they use to plate onto that. So they're plated onto the surface of the copper foil. Uh, the passivation layer, for example, is used to uh, convert um, during the lamination process at your laminator like Isola. So that uh, that's a bond treatment uh, layer as well as the signing coating on top of that. Um, the slides, yes, the slides will be available um, for you. I made some modifications uh, that are different than the invite was uh, the invite was um, um, placed in there. Um, so yeah, the that that will be those will be available to you. If you have any questions uh, further down, I didn't put my name and email in the bottom here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I can do that to, to 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 Lucy, and then she can have that. So uh, you can you can get a hold of me by email, and or we can have a conversation to further the understanding if you need that. Um, slide twenty nine is it? Uh, let me see. Did I get a, Did I get the one before that? Oh, is the nodularization conductive? Yes, it is. It's uh, like I mentioned. It's like a like a, a tin or brass uh, base type of uh, uh, coating on there. So yeah, it is. It is uh, conductive. Um, but it's not pure copper. Copper is not pure either. There's still some other elements in there. Uh, they say 99.99% pure copper. But obviously, there's some other things in there that that have uh, they they manipulate to to give the pro properties to the copper for their plating process in their plating bath. Okay, um, slide 29. There's an explanation for the green line sharp grain structure. Slide 29. I'm going to have to. Close this and go back. If I can go back. Oh, okay. Um, you're talking about these jagged lines here. Um, I I believe. Um, or is it? Uh, let me see. Let's see if I got the. Um, for the green line, sharp sharp green structure. Oh, so that's the question. Um, in this green line, when we did this testing, if I remember correctly, this was um, considered a one micron copper foil. And really, it's the surface topography of the copper foil that really creates this deviation away from, for example, these two foils or this deviation back here uh, uh, down below 10, 10 gigahertz. Uh, those deviations are really the surface foil uh, properties um, is why that happens. So, um, you know, that's, that's what happens. The RZ value, even though it's stated to be the same, um, it's really not. Um, and this could be a result of the nod nodularization process where the, the nodularization is different, um, or it could be the type of uh, passivation and barrier layer uh, that's coated on the material. Um, it might have nickel in it, for example, and maybe the uh, foil supplier at that time uh, didn't realize that nickel is a negative when you're talking about um, the, the, uh, the surface of that copper foil. You know, for example, uh, Enig, you know, has uh, nickel in it. Uh, it's, gold's great, but uh, nickel's not. So nickel has been removed from a lot of these copper foils nowadays. And so, uh, like I mentioned, this is probably about four or five year old uh, uh, chart here in the corner. So uh, a lot of changes have been made by the, by the uh, su suppliers. Okay, next one is how many dB will you gain in percent using very low uh, profile copper? Uh, copper compared to what you will gain using very low loss dielectric. I, th I think that question, I tried to answer that in general terms in the in slide number three, and I can go back there real quick and show that slide. Oh, great. <laughs> Sorry about that. This slide here. So, you know, what you're going to see on the uh, dielectric losses, you know, obviously the next generation of materials are going to move up. This is, I think that this, uh, this copper supplier, Mitsui, they did testing their Japanese company. So they did testing with our, our friends over at Panasonic. On, I believe this was on Megatron 6 at the time. So you can see that the, the next generation of, of dielectrics are going to be up, up in this, this range up in here uh, between the dielectric and copper loss. And then as the copper losses uh, decrease based on the trans, uh, you know, on the on the foil types, you're going to see more and more uh, of this move up towards the top of this chart here in reduced uh, dB per, per inch type of um, performance. The, the thing about it is, is that the relationship between these two, I think the, is gonna be more and more connected. And as you move up into the frequency, you know, 20, 20 is pretty low actually compared to 
what you're working in now, a lot of people are doing 28 gigahertz or 56 gigahertz PAM4. And so these numbers are going to be pretty large up there. And the losses for both materials, you know, um, this is the, um, I think this is a, a square root um, of the frequency versus, uh, um, you know, the dielectric's a little bit different. So uh, you're going to get uh, a separation as you get up into the much higher frequency ranges. Hopefully I answered that question. Uh, how much more expensive is a solution compared to conventional one? Uh, am I assuming that is um, um, a question regarding the copper foil cost? Um, I think I mentioned it's like 40 to 50 cents per square foot per side. So for every square foot, you're talking about adding roughly a dollar on an ultra low loss material uh, for cost wise. If you're talking about the PCB process of oxide, I'm not sure what that cost would be. Okay, so is the oxide step used to improve bonding to the inner layer dielectrics or is it used to prepare the surface for, for plating? Um, the bonding process is for uh, improving the copper foil, um, the copper foil bonding, right? So what the oxide process is doing is, is, is modifying the copper surface with some of the current processes in the industry so that it has a mechanical bonding surface. So the resin will interlock with that mechanical bond surface. But the next generation of bonding technology is using silings that uh, basically uh, the silene is a, connects the organic and inorganic uh, components of the, of the matrix. Uh, and that's what we use for glass to resin bonding as well. Um, and so that's what that's for is it modifies the surface for mechanical and then a silane is applied to the copper surface and that silane coating uh, creates a chemical bond uh, for that. So, um, and then uh, can you call me? Um, sure can. Um, let me see. Sorry about the voicemails. Uh, yeah, that's that was a problem. <laughs> we I think we got that fixed. Uh, but I'd be happy to give you a call. Um, Lucy, if you'd make sure I can get this information to call, I'd be happy yeah, to I will send it to you uh, after the webinar. Okay. Uh, what effect on um, copper roughness does fabricators' copper plating process have on the outer layers? And do they have lower profile copper plating processes? <laughs> That's a great question. And I, and I can't really honestly answer that for you. I have a colleague that may be able to answer that question. His name is Mike McMaster. He comes from the industry. He worked at TTM, Intel, APCT. Uh, he was an FAE and a, and a board salesperson for quite a long time. And he might be able to better answer that question. Um, my understanding is the plating, it's very much like the uh, copper plating on the titanium drum. Whatever surface you have, you're going to build your grain structure up off of that surface, and it tends to be very, fairly smooth. Um, and then they put that through an oxide process. But honestly speaking, um, what I've seen is the oxide process behaves differently with plated copper at the PCB fabricator in the outer layer process. So um, if you'd like, I can have Michael McMaster give you a call, Randy, and, and talk to you about that. So um, if you want to give uh, Lucy some information for contacting, we can get a hold of you and have Michael uh, answer that question unless he can get off mute and answer that himself. Oh, Michael is here. Go ahead. Michael is here. I, I don't see him. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, please forward the information and I'll get back with you on that so we can answer that question. Okay, okay um, our team was first mover on ITR and Tachyon. Thank you. I don't think that's a question, but thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, those are two very good materials, uh, but they are yesterday materials nowadays. <laughs> um, and Terra Green 400G is our next uh, level solution. So um, if you're interested in being the first mover on that material, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Um, is the oxide treatment solution that the copper foil laminate is immersed in? Um, yeah, the oxide treatment is a conveyor, typically a conveyorized treatment. Some suppliers still use a, uh, a, a tank um, where, where the material is, is immersed totally, the inner layer is immersed in, the, in a basket uh, tank system. Uh, but most, most suppliers are using a um, immersion process or a jet spray type of process in a conveyorized system. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, let's see here. Oh. Does Isola foresee the needs to change copper properties for MSAP purposes? Um, no, I don't think so. I think the MSAP processes 
are, are going to be fine for the, the copper. Um, it's not a super expertise area of mine, um, but uh, uh, that definitely uh, definitely is a good a good question to ask. We are working on SLP type laminates uh, based off the uh, new IS 580 G product and the TerraGreen 400 GE resin systems. Um, and those uh, SLP uh, very very low CTE uh, products are in development, and we've got samples that uh, we're working with a few selected uh, SLP type uh, manufacturers worth right now. Um, so um, that product is out there, but we're using the same foils that uh, we were using for the ultra low loss and extremely low loss product category. Um, how do you separate conductor loss um, from dielectric loss from the measurement data? That's a great question. Um, I, I don't know how that's done myself. It's not what I do. Uh, we do have an expert that does that. Uh, his name is Eamon Isaac. Um, he's the guy that I mentioned earlier, and he would be able to answer that question more carefully. Uh, but it's basically done uh, using the software on the VNA, in my understanding. But I don't understand the, the methodologies behind that. Again, if you would uh, like to uh, have a conversation with Isola and Eamon, uh, we can arrange that, uh, arrange that um, with you. Okay, next question. Uh, hey, there's Bert. Hi, Bert. <laughs> um, how does ARTF compare to VLP for risk of delamination? That's a that's a great question, and that's something that we do a lot of testing on. I had mentioned that we we build circuit boards for testing. Um, we currently use what we call the MRT seven test vehicle. It's a twenty mil, or twenty layer, one hundred and thirty mil uh, test vehicle that was developed by the HDP user group. Uh, that test vehicle has been one of the ones that we've done a lot of work on. We use that for our calf testing and delamination testing. And we put every copper foil that we're, that has been through the first two steps of screening I talked about into that TV. We run that. It's a pretty expensive test. And we take that back to our lab. We run delamination testing on clad and unclad samples of the boards. We also uh, do, uh, do some uh, uh, calf testing. And the calf testing will catch bond line failure. If there's a poor bond between the laminate and the uh, prepreg, we'll catch that. It'll show up in a bond line calf failure. We also will see that between the holes and the, the planes to holes in, in testing as well. And so, um, you know, the ARTF has been well tested. We've got two different suppliers, the two that were mentioned earlier that I've supplied some data on. Um, uh, Kotec is one and, and uh, circuit foil is another. Both of those foils perform equally as far as uh, electrical performance, and they both have very good uh, calf uh, test results and delamination capabilities as well, compared to a typical HVLP type copper that's out in the market today. And Bert, I think I answered your question on the copper suppliers for the ARTF, which is uh, currently Kotec. Uh, we have qualified for the epoxies, the RG311, and for the uh, and for the uh, um, high high performance, the PPO, PPE type materials, um, Patakia and TerraGreen 100G, or TerraGreen 400G and iTerra, we've qualified the RG312 materials and are working on qualification of the VL, the HVLP, the, the level three, uh, level four and level five with uh, those customers or suppliers. And so um, that seems to be the last question. Um, ah, one you're more. welcome, Bert. You know, you can call me anytime I see it as a design con. Okay, right, thank you Theo, you're much, welcome. Michael. Thank you everyone for joining. Okay, so I'll send this recent presentation out to, everybody, out to Julie, uh, not Julie, yeah, Lucy, so she can distribute it as uh, you have questions as you go through this a little slower. I'm happy to answer questions, happy to get other experts on the line to talk with you. Just please let us know. We'd be happy to share what we know about these uh, copper foils. Thank you very much, everyone. Much. Appreciate your joining this, this call. Have a great day. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.